Well, good evening, everyone. Good evening, everyone. Okay. I'm Paul Levin, president of the Marshall Foundation. I, I hope, hope you all had, had a great, great summer. summer. Thumbs, Thumbs up. Yeah. You ready for fall and some of the heat to go away? Yeah. Also, thought it was pretty good. Well, we had a very busy summer here. You may or may not remember, but uh, among other things, we had a dozen secondary school teachers here for a week of intensive learning on Marshall and the Marshall Plan. And they all went back with lesson plans and inspiration to their classrooms this fall. I'm happy to talk to you more about it at the reception if you'd like, but it was great. And just remember, your support helps make programs like that possible where we keep Marshall's legacy alive for the next generations. Now, uh, uh, if you'll, you'll permit me a couple of small housekeeping, housekeeping items, two calendar events for you. You, you probably got the postcard, but just to remind you, uh, we have another Legacy Lecture on October 12th, also here at 5.30. And that evening, Molly Manning will present The War of Words, How Marshall Mobilized GI Journalists and Helped Win World War II, which is a fascinating, fascinating topic. And... Um, one you won't want to miss. And, and then November 2nd will actually be our last Legacy Lecture for 2023, although we already have things on the calendar for next year. That evening, David Robarge will be speaking about George C. Marshall and intelligence. Not... <laughs> All right. And there's more information about him on the website or on the card that you should have gotten in the mail. Thank Dominion Energy for being the sponsor of the Legacy Series and a great partner to us at the Foundation. We're very grateful to them. And as always, if you have one of these, please turn it off or turn it down. Here is uh, the right of the bell or whatever your uh, ringtone is in the middle of in the middle of our talk. And one final note: we are again. You might notice the equipment keeps changing. Yeah. And this is to try to um, grow our audience for this lecture away from Lexington. So again, we are joined by people online on our YouTube channel. So we say hello to them, joining us from wherever they are in the world. And as a reminder to those of you on YouTube, the chat feature. Ask questions at the end of the lecture. Um, we will take the least snarky, most intelligent of, <laughs> of those questions and answer them. Um, or you just email Melissa Davis at librarian, marshallfoundation.org, and uh, she will be passing those questions and work on to the speaker. Our speaker, Thomas D. Arnold, is a U.S. Army instructor currently assigned to the Corcoran as a good pastor fellow a program name for a distinguished soldier and longtime Marshall Foundation board member, General Andrew J. Goodpather. So a nice little unexpected connection, but uh, we're, we're really glad to have Tom here. He's a second year PhD student examining Army media relations from 1939 to 1959. And his research interests focused on, focus on modern American military history, Cold War, and African American He's originally from Shreveport, Louisiana, and has served in command in Germany, Iraq, Afghanistan, Louisiana, and the Pentagon. He uh, impressively holds graduate degrees already from Louisiana Tech and Harvard. And after completing his studies at UVA, he will return to duty with the Army as a strategic planner and a policy advisor. Please join me in a warm welcome for Tom Arnold. Good evening, everyone. I'm very pleased to be here with you today. Uh, before I begin, I'd actually like to thank uh, a few organizations and individuals that have made uh, my research and journey along this process uh, very help uh, easier. Uh, first, uh, to the U.S. Army, if I can speak to you in a corporate form, uh, thank you for allowing me the opportunity to, to explore your history and tell your story. Uh, to the faculty with the Corcoran Department of History at the University of Virginia, Thank you for your patience and effort uh, transforming an old soldier into a passable scholar. Uh, for the George C. Marshall Foundation and Research Library, thank you for this opportunity and platform 
to share uh, this part of the Army story with a wider audience. Um, to Mrs. Nancy Woodside and the Woodside family, thank you very much for sharing your private collection with me and helping me understand this incident that we're going to talk about today so much better. It would have been impossible without your support. Thank you. Um, as a commissioned officer, I feel obligated to tell you that everything that we're going to talk about today are my opinions about what happened and the Army story and do not represent those of the Department of Defense, the uh, School of Advanced Military Studies, or the United States Combined Arms Center. So, in 1980, services must be avoided. Several are quite. Billy Mitchell's court martial in 1925, the bonus march in 1932, and General George S. Patton striking combat fatigue soldiers in 1943 feature prominently on the page alongside more forgettable characters and events that have since faded into obscurity. Sometimes a simple, now forgotten name was enough to recall an embarrassing episode. General Bennett Myers was simply identified with no explanation. His name alone was sufficient. Other entries seem misplaced entirely, highlighting actions that do not appear too controversial today, such as the short-lived period when the Army loaned pilots to the airmail service. Compiled just six years after World War II, half of the memo's entries focus on that war, war. Recording fiascos the Army could have handled better or would have preferred the public never learned about. The Army's World War II troop rotation policy is an example of the former. Transporting Madame Chiang Kai-shek's perfume and other luxuries over the hump is an embarrassing example of the latter. On a list of 16 episodes, one entry stands out because of its bizarre name. General Ben Lear's Yoo-Hoo episode. Despite occurring five months before the, um, America's formal entry into the war, the U incident was so vivid after the war that it ranked second on a list. It was an incident in which American soldiers had yelled cat calls, and one of the highest ranking generals in the Army had firmly disciplined the entire unit. While this silly curiosity is largely forgotten today, General Lear and the soldiers of the 110th Quartermaster Regiment and a few unknown ladies provided America its first wartime scandal. Despite the robust and relatively mature status of World War II historiography, you incident little or to limited scholarly attention. As an admittedly embarrassing episode, the Army's, the Army's official history of World War II makes no mention of the pre-war incident. The few works that do mention the incident essentially gloss over it or treat it as a curious interlude sandwiched between more important events. Lee Kennett's composite sketch of the soldier experience, GI, the American soldier from World War II, in passing, linking it to jokes and pranks in uniform. Paul Dixon's recent The Rise of the GI Army, uh, the incident is merely a speed bump between the Army's major pre-war training maneuvers of 1941. Aaron Hiltner's Taking Leave, Taking Liberty provides the most comprehensive treatment of the incident, linking it to broader patterns of soldier misconduct on the home front throughout the war. However, the soldier's behavior in the Yuhu incident was a far cry from the sexual crimes and indiscretions of some GIs later in the war. In its own way, the incident offers a prelude to the complex relationship between the wartime government when, 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 Worry here. The controversy to discipline his soldiers for their loose conduct. Although the episode began as a military incident, it quickly into a public affair that revealed more about Americans than it did their army. 
At the surface level, the affair appeared to be just another flashpoint and an ongoing controversy over women's attire and public behavior for men. The incident struck a nerve with many because of social progress and changing norms. But the most important aspect of the episode was the public debate over the Army's treatment of citizen soldiers. The U incident was a moment of rupture between the old Army and the American people, when the public's desire for a democratic Army were dashed by old-fashioned military discipline. For others, the incident proved that their fellow Americans knew nothing about the Army or a soldier's business. No matter which side they took, it seems that almost everyone had an opinion about Ben Lear's Memphis affair and, and was willing to share it. Before social media, newspapers did more than report the day's events. They served as a public forum. Americans aired their opinions in the papers for all to see. Editorials, op-eds, and letters to editor. Current events, especially the Yuhu incident. Squash the story. Newspaper archives comprise the bulk of the public record related to the incident, but they are more than a catalog of what happened between General Lear and his soldiers. Papers reveal the moment when the Army truly became our Army in the public mind. The U incident is when Americans finally took ownership of their post draft East Time Army. Before the Second World War, an intellectual and emotional gulf existed between the people and their army. From civilians harbored a dreary perception of the army and its soldiers in peace, particularly in the interwar period. A few short years after World War II, Brigadier General C.T. Lanham reminded Americans, quote, in times of peace, a free society regards its army with distaste and often suspicion. This is normal, for an army by its very structure is the antithesis of everything held dear by a democratic General Lanham's words after the war mirrored an army promotional booklet 40 years prior. Warning anyone recruiters, quote, in many parts of the United States, there are to prevail the idea army is to be in position which is below that of the ordinary citizen, which entails duties or labors degrading to an American. In 1935, Fortune magazine Nobody loves the army. Peace, it all but rots. Or might not have been. The army was, in fact, separate. Right now. Isolated from the rest of America by virtue of its posting. In characteristic manner, George C. Marshall laconic, laconically described lean years. Fortune magazine estimated in 1935 of the interwar period, America was 300 million a year for an army that did not option as a file. Times were indeed lean, not just for the service. In 1928, then Major Henry Hap Arnold, the future chief of the U.S. Army Air Forces, wrote children's books to supplement his income. Many enlisted soldiers could expect their net monthly pay might be zero or close to it. on payday. It was not uncommon for enlisted men to turn to gambling as a means to pass the time. Galleries were not the only area where Army life fell short. Government quarters were an issue as well. Officers and their families could regularly be found living in shacks and tents. 
and look for the essentially squat in abandoned buildings. In 1934, the Secretary of War reported to the President that Army housing was a menace to health and a disgrace to the government. His complaints fell on unsympathetic ears. Congress and the public were generally uninterested in the Army. And the public did turn its attention towards the Army. The average soldier's psychology and lifestyle were summarized as a mixture of The comparison of the army to the clergy garrison prerogative, and rarely caught the attention of the American public. Despite the austere living conditions and monotonous routines of garrison life, many soldiers and their families relished the Army's unique interwar lifestyle, quartered away from the rest of American society, and left to their own devices. The public, who would normally be indifferent to the Army in times of peace, were more so between the world wars because of disillusionment with the American experience in the Great War and the economic plight created by the Great Depression. Recalling the interwar period, one former reserve officer considered the average American to be tax burdened and uniform wary. Falsely, Congress authorized parcel acquisition of modern equipment. As the Army got smaller during the lean years, its soldiers hunkered down, focusing on their careers and family. The small tight-knit community that emerged was described by one officer's wife as a big family because the lean times and shared experiences forced many to lend and accept a helping hand, further isolating the Army community from the American. Military service became increasingly attractive for the sons of Army officers who grew up in and within the Army. It was not uncommon to find family with multiple generations serving the American military caste with no ties to the civilians they served. In 1938, the Chief of Staff of the Army summarized this, his situation. The Army has remained true to its traditions, withdrawn and aloof in peace, a forward, dependable bulwark in war. Of course, the pre-war mobilization of 1940 to 1941 was something different. It was a transitional period between peace and war. In the second half of 1940, the United States began preparing its military in case war reached its shores. Many citizens were concerned that Americans would inadvertently get involved in another great war that was none of their business, while the majority believed prudence required some form of military preparation. Public debate centered on the scope of the defense plan and who should serve. Congress reached a series of physical compromises to increase military readiness while seeing isolationist fears that America could recklessly rush all war. In August of 1940, Congress authorized the president to temporarily National Guard for one month to increase the Army's strength and readiness. The following month, America institutes Both actions changed America's relationship with its Army. In short order, almost every family in America had a male relative who was either in uniform, on the list to potentially get called up, or working in the defense industry. For the first time in the nation's history, the majority of the American people were interested in the peacetime affairs of their army. Its religious service, religious services, food, recreation, and even its discipline. A peacetime draft was a fairly radical concept for Americans to process in 1940. Prior to the draft, Americans were divided on the issue of conscription. However, many began to envision their post-draft peacetime army as something different than what it was before. Theirs was now a democratic army. Early proponents of the draft revived World War I notions that conscription would usher in a more democratic army that would resemble the so-called French model, which they believed was innately superior to the militarist German models of 1914 and 1939. They also believed that the infusion of citizen soldiers would produce a more egalitarian military 
that mirrored the individualistic American spirit by eroding what many perceived to be the aristocratic vestiges of the Army's hierarchy, customs, and traditions. One nationally syndicated columnist dreamed, every soldier must be an individualist. Under this system, you cannot make a good fighting man through old-fashioned methods of discipline, saluting, and close-order drills. So all that stuff will soon be out of the military window. A Democratic Army's discipline would be humanized, and leaders would keep their tempers. After the draft, the Democratic Army's worst enemy was supposedly Hollywood and its antiquated images of fire-eating sergeants terrorizing helpless privates. Not everyone agreed with these radical visions of the Democratic Army. For some Americans, the Army should or could not change its ways to pander to citizen soldiers. Strict military discipline was seen as a boo to the youth of the Depression years. How strict Army discipline remained after the draft was open to interpretation. Newsweek warned Americans not govern. Basically, discipline is just as strict as it was in all the essentials that I listed. are falling by the wayside. It appeared that the citizen soldier could not kill hierarchy, tradition, customs, or discipline after all. As the draft progressed, the Army was caught in the middle of two competing visions. Old citizen soldiers. Attempting to bridge the gap, General Marshall ordered officers to employ methods that would result in the cheerful and, un cheerful and understanding subordination of the individual to the good of the team. For General Marshall, the Democratic Army and the citizen soldiers had to meet in the middle and get to know each other. By Christmas of 1940, 11 National Guard divisions were serving on active duty, almost a Company A of the 110th Quartermaster Regiment was one such unit, reporting for duty on December 3, 1940, as part of the 35th Infantry Division. Made up mainly of men from Holdridge, Nebraska, Company A mustered into service with approximately 70 soldiers commanded by Captain Harold Winquist before relocating to Camp Joseph T. Robinson near Little Rock, Arkansas. At Camp Robinson, the company expanded to form the Provisional Truck Battalion of the 110th Quartermaster Regiment. The new soldiers came from all over the Midwest, but it remained under the command of Captain Winquist. The battalion shipped out in May 1941 to the Army Supply Depot in Murphy, Murfreesboro, Tennessee, for a large-scale exercise. The exercise was eventually known as the Universe. General Patton's newly formed 2nd Armored Division and experimenting with armored warfare tactics. General Patton declared that the maneuvers made his soldiers mad enough to fight like hell. Field conditions might have angered the soldiers as well. The training area was Spartan, with limited access to recreation facilities, mess halls, and indoor plumbing. By the end of the exercise, many soldiers were reportedly afflicted with an unknown illness known as dust bowl throat. The battalion departed Murfreesboro early Sunday morning, July 6, 1941, hoping to get back to the comforts of Camp Robinson just after sundown. The convoy consisted of 80 cargo trucks laden with 350 soldiers and their equipment. After several hours, the jurisdiction in the hot Tennessee hill, the convoy finally rolled into the outskirts of Memphis. It was not long before the men saw the long-forgotten sights and sounds of modern life. After several hours broiling under the sun, their enthusiasm quickly boiled over. Several men began making merry by waving at girls and shouting boisterous pleasantries at civilians. As the convoy passed the Memphis Country Club, the soldier spied three young ladies clad in shorts on the sidewalk. Whistles, a yoo-hoo, a hi, baby, and probably the provocative question, one at daddy, disturbed the calm. An eyewitness of the soldier's antics, Mr. Rainer Allen reported that, quote, one of the soldiers at the tailboard of the truck grabbed another in a close and passionate embrace and went into motions 
similar to portions of the Conga. Mr. Allen believed the young women were not amused, and I do not think their fathers, even if they had been ex-servicemen, would have been pleased. What was it about shorts on a hot summer's day that could send the soldiers? <laughs> While shorts are a unisex fashion staple today, they were somewhat novel attire for women in 1941. Around the time of the incident, fashion columnists advised women that shorts were best worn on a tennis court or by the sea. Pleated skirts were preferable. Opinions were mixed, however. One syndicated columnist, Mian Young, suggested that shorts were an essential item in a modern mix and match wardrobe. Photographs accompanying Ms. Young's column featured two slender young ladies, one in slacks, the other wearing high-waisted mid-thigh shorts. The choice of svelte models illustrated one San Francisco advertisement promised to address. Shorts for amply proportioned Juno were in short supply. Based on one advertisement, it appears that off-the-rack or sew-it-yourself options mostly cater to junior miss sizes 11 through 17. Ultimately, the archive reveals that shorts were on the verge of gaining acceptance as casual shorts, but they remained controversial in many regions. There were two camps in the fight over shorts that summer, those in favor and those against. Both of those to the papers and Sacramento B ran so many letters harping on the issue that one exasperated reader pleaded with his neighbors to give us a rest on shorts. Coverage of the Mussolini alone wore on shorts that summer. Shorts clad seniorinas riding bicycles. She had many supporters. <laughs> and there seem to be few girls who can wear them attractively. Illustrated an interesting aspect of the anti shorts movement. The Shorts faction was a fragmented coalition. Opposition was often conditional, depending on the location, the occasion, the offender's figure, or a combination of all three. Miss Moore believed Beef Town Parsons should be off limits to shorts, but did not mention other things. Many men and women in Sacramento, California, agreed it was crude and vulgar for women to wear shorts in their city while public officials in Redlands, California, remained undecided as summer temperatures soared. Some advice columns counseled readers to consider the OK as well as location. Shorts were deemed inappropriate attire for sent to stay house guests. The belief was that the shorts were making the hotel look bad. And I quote, heaven forbid, West Hill's concern for lights an interesting dimension in the, in the debate, the middle ground. But it's across America, could generally agree on one thing. Shorts garnered the attention of the opposite sex, whether they wanted to or not. It appeared that many believed women in shorts craved male attention. Of course, there were more practical Americans who recognized shorts as a comfortable summertime option, but the most reasonable were soft-spoken in the debate. Whether women in shorts wanted male attention or not, it would have been downright un-American to many if their soldiers had let a bevy of young ladies escape without a yoo-hoo or two. One lady from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, who saw it differently, wrote in to tell her community, this is nice. Women wear shorts. They know how to take care of themselves. But she ended her letter on a cautionary note. 
men don't show your feelings. As the convoy's antics crescendoed outside the Memphis Country Club, a leather-faced golfer was getting ready to tee off the soldier's yell or in the gentleman's when the gentleman handed his club to the caddy, jumped the fence, and waved down a passing command car. The soldiers' officers were definitely shocked when they discovered the gentleman dressing them down was none other than Lieutenant General Benjamin Lear, who commanded the entire Second Army, of which their unit... While the antics had definitely sold his Sunday round of golf, General Lear with a with soldier hiss. General Lear was one of the most senior officers in uniform, in rank and age, and widely recruited as a disciplinarian of the old school. In 1898, then Private Lear enlisted in the 1st Colorado Infantry Regiment during the Spanish American War. He removed himself from his peers and was rapidly promoted to the rank of First Sergeant, a senior enlisted leadership position. It was in this position that First Sergeant Lear commanded his own father, a private in the potatoes for, for complaining about his lot in life. Army commission in the Between 1898 and 1941, General Lee Stone climbed the ranks, competing favorably against his peers. Serving in Mexico, overseas, and domestic. Overseas tours included the Philippines, Cuba, and Panama. His domestic instructor positions generally are chased bandits on the Mexican border in the 1960s, but rode out the Great War on a dead One fact about the old cavalry he won a bronze star, uh, he won a bronze medal in the 1912 Olympics with the U.S. equestrian team. Perhaps that is why he continued to wear his cavalry boots long after they had fallen out of fashion. In addition to being a General Lear was an army player, expert person, and an General Lear's recreational habits were for her experience the army. Though they were generally more well-traveled than their civilian counterparts, Sirson lived austere la la in an insular society. were necessary. Officers and their families were expected to enjoy in the name of the service. General Lear's only, only child, a daughter, was born in an army tent in Cuba. Although they were just as American as any civilian, the regulars favored duty, sacrifice, honor, and compliance over rugged individualism. To many civilians, men like General Lear appeared to be nothing more than martinets. But the officers who endured the interwar period spent the majority of their adult lives preparing to raise another army of citizen soldiers to defend democracy. With almost 1.5 million drugstore cowboys in uniform, the U.S. Army in 1941 had plenty of dash, spit, and polish. Many citizens imagined the draft would infuse the army with a more spirit and enlisted men in a big happy family. However, training maneuvers revealed the army needed quick football field obedience if America's youth were to survive on the modern battlefield. 
The regulars probably agreed with General Lear's public response to congressmen who questioned his methods. His response, quote, a high state of discipline is the foundation upon which all military attainment is based. Loose conduct and rowdyism cannot be tolerated. So long as I am the commander of second duty, soldierly standards of conduct will be demanded of all individuals in uniform. With this in mind, General Lear probably wondered if further action was required to teach as the convoy pulled away. As soon as the soldiers returned to Camp Robinson, Hot showers, warm food, and comfortable beds. July 7th, 1941. It appeared that the gentleman on the punishment was potentially in store for the No telling how long they had been tumbled out of Camp Robinson. The men were so exhausted that one of them fell asleep at the wheel, wrecking his truck. After the road, the convoy pulled over to catch a two hour nap before resuming at dawn. The first year trucks pulled in at 11 30 a.m. Monday morning. An hour later, officers and not commissioned officers of the Provisional Truck Battalion, commanded by Captain Winquist, marched into General Lear's office. was obviously one-sided, with Captain Winquist bearing the brunt of the general's force. The old cavalry officer's diatribe was not recorded in full but it was speculated to have been colorful and quite memorable. What is known to it is that the general told the soldiers their conduct was a disgrace to the Army, the 35th Division, and the regiment. General Lear advised the officers from over, and he would accept their resignations if offered. As a former non-commissioned officer himself, he had a special warning from the sergeants in this room. He would demote all of them if they could not maintain order. The men knew these threats were not idle. General Lear's thoughts on leadership were wild. And incompetent leaders is of greater importance than defective, ineffective weapons. Last month, General Lear had shown a firm hand by stacked incompetent leaders and sloppy leaders forming the American Army into the first rate organization. General Lear concluded the meeting by or ordering Captain Winquist to have his men and equipment ready at the Memphis airport for a full in ranks inspection that afternoon. Papers did just quarter when General Lear arrived at the soldiers' temporary airport encampment, but it was probably late afternoon when he completed his inspection. A local reporter with the commercial appeal captured the scene in words and on film. Prior to the general's arrival, the unshaven and sleepy-eyed troops prepared under the broiling sun. During the inspection, the soldiers stood in front of their pup tents with their equipment at their feet. While they might have been the inspection, General Lear assessed the addressed the troops. His admonishments. The soldiers are still in perhaps. The orders were already starting to swarm. But the commercial appeal was present to see how it started. Packing equipment and massaging feet in anticipation. Corporal Esco A. Brooks could barely hide a grin as he rubbed the sole of his right foot.
Times are true for him to start at 6 or 8 a.m. Live here. I'm going quietly from the window for God's message. About five miles after crossing the Mississippi River, over the Harriman River, beyond the Arkansas Flats and began their formed a single column on the side of the road. Started walking. The first group walked five miles. And not first. But then the truck made their next turn. The on again, off again process repeated. So all soldiers had logged 15 miles a foot. Um, 13 soldiers fell out of former Said he had just been released from the hospital. Perhaps he was recovering from dust bowl. For the rest of the men, a dentist caught in the law. This was already medicine in the time. Aside from treating blisters and back aches, the lone doctor forced hydration. Draining a can of tea or three was essential because the temperature reached 97 degrees, making July 8, 1941, the hottest day in two years. After everyone had marched their fifteen, convoy cruised back home and was welcomed into Little Rock by crowds of soldiers and civilians. Most of the and blistered troops ignored their well-wishers, dreaming of hot showers and comfortable beds. Thankfully, the unit received ten days further gaining July like, 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 forty-one. The nation wanted to have its say. If the army had its way, the U incident would have died a quiet death after July 14th. Confidential War Department are motivated. At the next press conference, treating the matter as of little confidence. Featuring the best lines, lines, lines. This will be the last of the letters printed on the subject. Contributions on other subjects are welcome. The commercial appeal was not the only paper to run a photo photo. Customers had to stay. Those that did not print a letter, letters. What exactly did Americans think about the U.N. Similar to that summer's short debate, Americans were divided into two camps, those who favored General Lear and those who reviled him. General Lear's supporters came from all walks of life and counted soldiers and others, as well as veterans, amongst their fold. The general's fans did not consider mass punishment an abuse of power. Indeed, Many were proud that he took immediate action to restore discipline in their army. The soldiers deserved punishment for disrespecting their uniform and not the ladies. On the other hand, the editor of the Army Times and others believed the young ladies were victims, not the punished soldiers. Some even argued that the congressional hounding of the general was out of bounds, making General Lear the most unlikely of victims. No matter who the victims were, General Lear's proponents believed he was correct in restoring order and would have been so no matter what method he chose. After all, who should know a better way to discipline the troops than a three-star general? In the eyes of General Lear's supporters, a Democratic army was not an undisciplined army. On a national level, the anti-Nabirists appeared to be in the majority. They were united those methods were the wrong course. That possibly innocent and guilty life without due process was the one way of the fifth. Frightened they would steal ladies' affections from him. 
The most strident opposition to General Lear outside of Congress came from women, particularly the mothers of soldiers. Concerned mothers actively petitioned for General Lear's ouster, while some more that the scandal would precipitate his resignation. One incensed mother whose son passed out during the 15-mile march sought more immediate satisfaction. She wanted to slap General Lear's face. <laughs> Clearly, the ladies were serious. A few incensed mothers and sore feet could not squash America's love of parody. In addition to the generally unserious tone of much of the news coverage, the editorial pages lampooned the affair. One such editorial suggested that General Lear's actions were not in defense of his battered ego, or the young ladies, or the army, but rather the millions of golfers interrupted by the hijinks of raucous spectators everywhere. Instead of disciplining his troops, General Lear brought out order and a quiet respect for the game. Perhaps the strangest response to modern eyes and ears were the jingles. Several writers satirized the episode in song and poem. The classic Yankee Doodle was repurposed in 1941 to skewer General Lear. The most creative jingle reimagined when the foreman bears his steel from the Gilbert and Sullivan's now obscure 1879 comic opera, The Pirates of Penzance. As expected, there were also political cartoons. No side was spared by the cartoonists of 1941. One of the more progressive takes had two young ladies asking a perplexed officer, did anyone think to ask if we minded being you hooies? In another cartoon, conservative were depicted by a reclining soldier pampered by his doting mother, asking, did itty boy have to walk 15 miles? Powdering the soldier's bare feet was a congressman, exclaiming, discipline, bah, I'll talk about this. The, car the cartoons definitely captured the varied opinions of the time, sparing no one in the process. Ultimately, the humors captured in the archive reveal a kaleidoscopic image of America after the draft, but before Pearl Harbor shattered the peace. Instead, the army complained about the whole affair. The timing and rather odd probably had something to do with the arrival of the Army's new Director of Public Relations, Brigadier General Alexander Searles, another old cavalryman. The study's distance from the incident facilitated a comprehensive approach that generally, generally reflected the newspaper coverage. Analysts adopted a mixed quantitative, qualitative approach to explore the press's reaction. What did the Army discover after the dust had settled? The Army graded 494 news stories accordingly. 0% were very favorable. 3% were favorable. 23% were noncommittal. 53% were unfavorable. And 21% very unfavorable. Army analysts also studied 170 editorials, which revealed similar treatment. 4% were favorable. 15%, I'm sorry. 4% were very favorable, 15% were favorable, 30% were neutral, and 25% were unfavorable. The bulk of the coverage that summer was decidedly negative. Clearly, General Searles and his newly formed War Department Bureau of Public Relations had their work cut out for themselves. Qualitative side of the study provided some clues. The Army observed that humor and satire mixed with criticism, increasing the speed of unflattering stories. It also learned that Congress, congressional grandstanding, and generals made for a volatile mixture. Finally, the Army discovered that American society was not homogenous. Army public relations had to account for, quote, indignant mothers, legionnaires, young women, and various other people. But it did not offer ready-made solutions. General Searles and company would need more time on the training to improve their tactics the four-page study was informative as it was brief. What did this? By exclusively focusing on reporters and editors, the Army failed to account for John and J.H.Q. Public. Yes, the Army recognized that there were more dimensions to American society than it probably liked. But what the study did not detect was the shift in its relationship with the American people. The hoopla revealed 
that the public was not only interested in the service, but they also wanted to know its affairs. The Army social contract was under review in July 1941. Americans were heavily invested in the post-draft Army in a way that no pre-war mobilization plan ever predicted. It was their Army now. To his credit, General Lear seemed to understand the shift in the relationship. When pressed by Army public relations officers to tell his side of the story, General Lear responded, quote, I can take it. I will not vindicate myself at the expense of the American soldier. He's going to be needed for bigger things than this. General Lear believed the war was coming and that his soldiers needed America's support for the real battles ahead. He recognized a personal defense would only have prolonged the episode. Public sentiment and sympathy had finally swayed in favor of the soldier, transforming the GI from a second-class citizen into a heroic figure. Once Americans took possession of their army and accepted their soldiers as heroes, they needed a villain. General Lear was thrust into this unfortunate position. It became a role he could never quite shake. An obscure figure today, General Lear was very familiar to the World War II generation because of the Yuhu incident. The affair would haunt him for the remainder of his, of his life. In 1945, General Lear was welcomed home with jeers and sarcastic yoo-hoos as he dis disembarked a troop ship in Boston Harbor after having served as General Dwight D. Eisenhower's deputy towards the end of the war in Europe. When a thankful Congress honorarily promoted General Lear to full general, that is four stars, in 1954, the press recounted the episode in articles to remind their audience who Lear was in case they had forgotten him. The incident was even woven into his obituaries. American pre-war sympathy for the soldier peaked with the draft extension in August 1941, only a few weeks after the Yuhu incident began disappearing from the papers. Shortly after the extension debate and vote, the GI's soldierly prowess was on full display during the famed Louisiana maneuvers between August and September 1941. Surprising to many American, Americans, Lear's deft generalship during the maneuvers almost rehabilitated his public image, but the Yuhu incident was simply too powerful to overcome. It is easy to believe that the incident was remembered because it was such a silly curiosity, pitting good-humored American boys against an egotistical, uniformed autocrat. But focusing on the characters obscures the true nature of the event. The Yuhu incident was more than a commander disciplining a bunch of rowdy soldiers on a hot summer's day. It marked the moment when America's relationship with its army finally changed. That is the moment when it became our army. To their credit, the soldiers of the 110th Quartermaster were unfazed by the affair and went on to serve their nation with distinction. A few weeks after the incident, General Lear personally checked on his soldiers with another inspection. He came away impressed, proclaiming the 110th Quartermaster to be the best supply regiment in Second Army. The general apparently meant his praise because he singled out the unit again during the grueling Louisiana maneuvers by publicly recognizing their fine work, splendid esprit, and soldierly conduct. High marks from the famed disciplinarian. After Pearl Harbor, the 110th Quartermaster went on to serve in the European Theater of Operations and earned the Army's Meritorious Service Unit Plaque in 1945 before demobilizing. While the U incident did not mar their service, it left quite the impression on the young men. In good humor, they adopted Yuhu as a lifelong informal motto of sorts. Just after their famous march, several men traveled back home in a car emblazoned with graffiti, proudly proclaiming their occupants to be members of the Yuhu Battalion and asking onlookers, need a caddy buddy? <laughs> General Lear might have restored discipline, but his measures did not dampen the troops' spirits. While the episode's notoriety would eventually fade, the soldiers' attachment to the phrase never waned. The incident surviving veterans proudly held out their unofficial moniker long after their service ended, using it on their alumni newsletter and memorabilia. Thank you all for y'all's time tonight. I, I believe this is the question and answer portion. Uh, <laughs> I don't know if we want to take uh, questions from the audience or if we want to jump to the people on the, the live stream or not. The audience first. 
Yes, sir. So, uh, despite uh, uh, Roy Lear appeared during that incident, he apparently had a fairly successful uh, career up to that. He did. Yeah, I mean, uh, to point the, as you said, Deputy Eisenhower, and then subsequently, I guess, Congress came a four star several years after that. So, he must have done pretty well professionally after that. He did. He's, he's, he's actually, despite his obscurity, he's a remarkable, remarkable individual. So in 1941, he's 62 years old when this incident occurs. He's running up on his mandatory retirement age, and they're going to have to kick him out, right? It's just the law. And they do. He's immediately recalled back into service because he's seen as not just a disciplinarian, but a, a, a very uh, good manager and trainer. And he, uh, he's known for that. Marshall respects that. Um, he gets, he gets fleeted up after McNear dies um, during the war. And then eventually, uh, because the Army replacement system and decisions that were made uh, to, with the, the 90 Division gambles so that we don't have enough, we actually start running out of troops during the war. And the, the, the potential to have to reorganize and refit units in theater to keep fighting Germany uh, was a huge concern for Eisenhower. And Marshall sends Lear to Europe to actually get a handle on everything in the rear and try to figure out how are we going to keep, if the war drags on, how do we keep in the fight? Because we were just running out of Schlitz at that point. So, but yes, he, it, again, his obscurity, uh, it, you know, it's noted, but it, it's kind of odd because he was a, a remarkable character and he was, uh, I get in a way vital to the war effort at, at multiple points. Yes, sir. Uh, two questions. One, did he escape Marshall's uh, slashing the off of the general officer corps? Uh, Marshall retired as soon as he became chief of staff. As I understand, he retired a bunch of officers. Okay. Let me take. Can I take one question at a time? Sure. Okay. So the, yes. So the question was for the the audience dialed in. Uh, did he survive? Did Gen General Lear? Survive the the slashing of officers. Absolutely, he did. In fact, uh, he just loved to get in hot water. <laughs> what well, Truman's one of Truman's. Uh, this is Senator Truman, not not President Truman or Vice President Truman. You know, later on, but one of Truman Senator Truman's family was a was a um, division commander underneath Second Army. And he was sacked for his incompetence. Who sacked him? General Lear. Uh, and so that, and again, embroiled him in another uh, political, uh, you know, challenge. So he did survive, and then he also contributed to the kind of the the impression of cleaning house uh, during the, that early part of the mobiliz or the mid part of the mobilization period. And then your second question, sir. How did you pick this topic? <laughs> um, I, the, so the question was, how did I how did I pick this topic? It picked me. I stumbled into it. Um, the the memo that we saw at the beginning of the the, the presentation. Um, when I first started doing my research, uh, COVID restrictions still impacted access to archives. So the only archive I could get into as an army officer was was with my ID card. And I went to the Center for Military History, and I just said, hey, I'm interested in public relations, which nobody's interested in. Let me see, uh, let me see what you got. And this this comes up, and and I I when I saw that second line, you know, I, it's a pretty short memo, right? I was like, well, this, what does General do? He likes chocolate. Like, well, well, I didn't I didn't understand, right? And so, I, and and then later on, as I'm continuing with my coursework, my second year in the program, uh, I was required to do a, a, what they call a microhistory essay type thing, and uh, where you take something small and try to figure out if it has larger implications. Is it important? And uh, I just I, I bet everything on this thing, and it, it worked out. It worked out. So, yes, sir. Kind of a follow-on on that is, is you look at that list in this episode, it, it implies that the Army spent a good time studying these episodes that could have been avoided. Do you think the focus was more on the general's actions or the managing the press release and, and the, how the press responded to the, the event? I think it's more on the management. So at the... Okay, so let me, let me go back. So for the, the audience that's dialed in, um, the question is, is uh, what was the purpose of this memo for? Uh, why, why would it have been existing, you know, compiled six years after the fact or something like that? Um, so this, this document was prepared by the, the U.S. Army Center of Military History, but it's based on uh, 
uh, another document of, of a larger set of documents that were developed by, you see it, you probably can't read it, but the Army Information School at Carlisle Barracks. That was the Army Public Relations School after the war. With information was public relations at that point. They gave it a nice name. Um, and so this, I suspect that this is a list of instructional materials that were used to train public relations officers on you know, how does the Army get in trouble and then how can you help get, you, get the Army out of it. I suspect that's what it is. I have no evidence other than I fact, I know that the researcher that compiled the list pulled the data from the information schoolhouse. It appears that the archival material that the information school had is, uh, the Army never loses anything, it's just misplaced for the moment, right? So. Yes, ma'am. This is one of the online questions. Oh, terrific, yeah. Um, could this have happened after Pearl Harbor? Yeah, that's it. That's so the, the question is, is could this event have occurred in, in, uh, after Pearl Harbor? That's an interesting counterfactual, right? So here's, here's, a, here's a couple of thoughts. I, I, think, I think potentially. The, the issue had salience with so many Americans immediately because unbeknownst to General Lear and these soldiers, America and all these different communities, Kansas, multiple communities in California for sure, um, and in a, a, a few cities on the East Coast that I'm aware of, we're all individually debating, you know, can we, what, or should women be allowed to wear shorts? You know, that just society, different cities are all debating this. So it had salience at the moment when it occurs. Um, but there were competing images within American society for what a democratic army was, right? What it would be. Um, and I think that anything that would have sp sparked outrage or had people concerned with the army and mass punishment um, and, and other things. So I didn't get into it in the essay, but there was a lot of interesting thoughts about what a democratic army would be. One example would be it would be less uh, aristocratic. Well, what's that mean for a, an American army? People would write in and they envisioned a less aristocratic army would be officers that don't play golf, right? Um, pe people that, uh, you know, they, they were concerned about how soldiers were uh, fed, uh, how, how they, their religion and other things like that. And I think any incident that would have occurred that would have gotten traction, um, that would have rubbed, you know, that would have ripped the tarnish off or, or showed people that there, these in some instances, outlandish concepts of a, of a democratic army. Anything that belied that belief, I think, would have sparked that incident because people would have debated and it would have gotten, it would have riled up, especially the, the veterans, the, the World War I veterans who thought these guys had it soft. Uh, so, good, good question. Yes, sir. I note that this had no effect on shorts, uh, <laughs> part of the military uniform, summer uniform. Yes, sir. It, this didn't affect that. No, I, so, I'll, I'll, so the question is, is did it affect, or, it, or the observation is it did not affect the, the Army's position on, on summer shorts uniform. Uh, my, my research was, was, was largely externally focused on the social stuff, and I did not look at or find anything that spoke to uh, implications towards the, the American Army donning shorts, uh, sort of like kind of like the desert attire that the, the British employed, things like that. I, I, did, not, I did not pursue that, so I'll, I'll claim ignorance on that issue, sir. So the men can flaunt and the women can't. <laughs> there, there were, and, and, and Sacramento, and Sa Sacramento had, a, their paper's a real treat to read if you ever get a chance to, to look at some of the archives on it, because it was a very, it was a very literate society based on the, the comments that would come in. But uh, that actually is a discussion that was taking place in Sacramento was, well, you know, if men can do it, we can do it. And um, that, it, th these debates, these debates lasted a very, I mean, several weeks, right? Um, and so that, comments like that did. And then um, you would have, occasionally you would have, uh, I mean, I don't know who's, you have to trust that these people are telling the truth when they write, when you're reading these, you know, these letters to the editor. But you'd have old 
they would sign Old Maiden, you know, so an Old Maiden would wish that she could wear shorts to attract men. Uh, and it would, it would improve her uh, dating odds back then. And I think, I think she, was, she was talking about the 1920s, so. Yes, sir. Did the women themselves leave any record of what they thought? Did anyone interview them? Were they in the press? about their reaction. Yes, yeah, so the, the question is, is what do we know about the women that were involved in this? <laughs> it's, it's open for debate. General Lear's official report to the War Department does not mention any women on the street. So he's playing at the, he's playing at the Memphis Country Club on Central Avenue in Memphis. Um, there was a party ahead of him with one woman playing golf. I actually started looking into this, and I don't know what the dress code at the time was for the Memphis Country Club, but other country clubs in that part of the country, um, well, I guess Kansas is not really that part of the country, but at least in Kansas, I was able to find mention of the dress codes there. And women were not allowed to wear shorts. They could wear slacks or skirts, pleated skirts, but not, not shorts. Now, I don't, know what is, I don't know what this woman was wearing. There is a mention... I was able to find in the newspaper records of one witness who observed the soldiers doing this, this, these, these shenanigans. Um, there was one woman who was, this is not me, this is what was written in. There was one woman who was not even in shorts to have garnered the soldiers' attentions, much less affections. But the, the, the question that I struggled with was, this, this is a, this convoy is like 80 trucks, so it's 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 stretched out. I mean, I don't it's not, probably not a mile, but it's it's hundreds, if not thousands, of meters long. And uh, so, any eyewitness to what occurred that General Lear would have been privy to or witnessed is, you know, the, the reporters trying to track these people down is going to be pretty difficult. I do suspect that there were women, um, I that. That, that were getting catcalled. Um, but I, I, I also believe that the incident as it occurred by General, by General Lear was actually probably just them harassing him uh, because it did spoil his Sunday round of golf. <laughs> um, and him having been uh, you know, a commissioned officer and an N a former NCO, his duty is to respond. If he doesn't respond and correct this, then he set a new standard for his organization, and he would, he would seemingly allow or tolerate this type of behavior, which is uh, unacceptable, um, especially if he's, they're doing it towards women, back then even, um, and he'd have corrected that. Um, and then if it matters, he, um, he actually held progressive ideas and he thought that shorts were actually fine in an athletic setting. He had qualified in an, in athletic settings, so he probably wouldn't have had a, had an, an issue if there had been shorts on the golf course that day. Uh, if it matters to anybody in the audience, <laughs> yes, ma'am. One more question from sure. the email. Um, when the War Department said the incident was closed, did they really think that the U.S. journalists would fall in the line, <laughs> or they were were they just hopeful? I, I think they were hopeful. So the, the public relations enterprise was greatly expanded at this point in the war. And it was within the War Department itself, it's, it's, it's approaching several hundred people. And just a few months prior, it had only been like five dudes. Um, now, as it expands, all of the military camps uh, are each assigned their own public relations officer. And a lot of times, it was actually an office. So at Camp Joseph T. Robinson, so Camp Robinson in Arkansas, the, the camp newspaper was called the Wagon Wheel uh, for the 35th Infantry Division. Their, their, their patch is a wagon wheel. Uh, they actually put out, like, you're not, you will not talk about this. So the, the Army's attempt at, at the tactical level was rather ham-fisted and blew up in its face because that became a st story all of its own. Uh, I, I suspect that the Army was hopeful um, because the, the story lingers. So it starts July 7th. The, the press is hot on, it, hot on it by 8 July. It's all over it on 8 July. It persists throughout the month of July, and it's only overcome by the draft extension. And there was an article published in Look magazine 
that talks about how low the morale was, and that's when you see the rise of the Ohio, the uh, uh, over the hill in October movement, or not movement, but saying, and and so that becomes the next story is like how low is morale? Um, these soldiers had pretty good morale, uh, apparently, um, even after the incident, and so that 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 became kind of the next fiasco, and then you know it's kind of like the news cycle today. It's just one thing after the other, and nothing ever really seems to get resolved. And then after that, it's the, 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 the Louisiana maneuvers. Um, and then morale come, becomes an issue again. But uh, I think that in July 14th, when the, when the Army drafted that memo, it was more hopeful than actually like, well, we can, we can tell these guys to stop it. You know, I don't think they had that. Particularly because the, when that memo was written, it was written as the Bureau of Public Relations, the Army's big public relations machine, is actually undergoing a leadership change. The 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 guy that stood up the organization, uh, General Robert C. Richardson Jr., is on his way out the door, and the the General Alexander Day Searles, who I mentioned in the in the presentation, is actually uh, about a month away from taking the seat. So the acting guy is uh, at the time he was Colonel Colonel uh, Lord uh, wrote the memo. And that became the the War Department's policy. He gave that to, it went up to, it went to the public relations, the broader public relations department, but also uh, Stem, uh, Secretary of War Stimson and General Marshall also saw, got copies of it as well. Great question from the from the uh, from the the world, I guess. <laughs> yeah, bigger than this room. <laughs> Any more questions? Yeah. No. Well, then join me and thank you, Tom. Thank you.